Couple more people coming in. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. I'm really excited to hear from our panelists on this important and very relevant to Colorado topic. What is the future of corn or a regenerative food system? Um, I do see some familiar faces on the call tonight, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michaela Blanton. Um, I'm the campaign coordinator for our regenerative ag and local food committee at 350. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that we are recording this event and we're also live streaming it to Facebook. So please turn off your camera if you're uncomfortable with this. And then I'd also like to remind you that we will have time for questions at the end, and you can drop your questions into the chat throughout the presentation. We would like to begin tonight's event with a land recognition. We honor and acknowledge that Colorado is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Lakota, Ute, Apache, Shoshone nations, and others. We further acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what, we, what is now called Colorado. We would also like to recognize that indigenous communities have depended on corn for millennia as both a source of nutrition and as a part of cultural tradition. I encourage everyone to keep this in mind as we discuss the future of corn tonight. And in acknowledgement of this, I'm also really happy to announce that our March webinar will be focused on indigenous wisdom. We hope that you'll be able to join us and be on the lookout for more details. So before I introduce everyone tonight, all of our panelists, we are gonna kickstart our webinar with a warm up poll. Um, I'm gonna launch it now. It's our first time doing this for one of our webinars. So I hope it goes well. All right, can everyone see that? All right, awesome. So if everyone could just take a second, answer the poll. Oof. All right, I'll give it 30 more seconds. All right, I'm going to end it. All right, let's share the results. Okay, cool. So it looks like we have a wide variety of people with knowledge on corn and regenerative food systems um, from all around the state. And I will admit that I had to look up the last answer as well. <laughs> so if you didn't know it, it's okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, I think that's a good introduction for our panelists. Um, Philip Taylor is the executor, executive director and co-founder of MAD Agriculture, which is an organization that helps to develop holistic carbon farm plans with ranchers and farmers, helping them to transition to a regenerative economy by providing financial and technical assistance, as well as access to new markets. Phil is also a professor at CU Boulder, which is how I was first introduced to him. Nick DiDomenico is a regenerative designer, farmer, and builder. Nick is the co-founder of Elk Run Farm and Homestead, which began as a dry and barren piece of land that Nick and his partner have restored through regenerative practices. Daniel Mooney is an assistant professor and an extension economist in agricultural and resource economics at Colorado State University. His work is currently focused on problems related to sustainable crop production, agricult agricultural technology adoption, livestock enterprise management, and food systems development. And then last but not least, we have Mary Purdy, who is an integrative eco dietitian who consults around creating a sustainable and resilient food system that supports our environment and helps to mitigate climate change. She is the author of multiple books and has hosted over 100 nutritional workshops and webinars. I also want to quickly thank our new intern, uh, Rebecca Stobie, for her work on this and support tonight, as well as Dina Rosen, who is one of our committee members for her detailed planning of this event. And then finally, I just wanna thank you all for being here tonight and remind you that without your support, events like this wouldn't be possible. We're very, very grateful for you. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Phil. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me. And I, I just felt like this is such a fascinating conversation that feels, um, when I was first invited to talk about corn and regeneration, 
it feels so specific, yet corn is um, the most abundant and prolific or among the most abundant and prolific crops that we have lived with, domesticated as a society. And, um, and we work with it all the time um, in our work. So Mad Agriculture is really focused on helping folks stuck within the industrial ag system to sort of break free of those confines um, and imagine a different way of turning monocultures into diversity, into restoring wild places. And so we work with large scale farmers across the country, um, typically growing corn and beans and alfalfa and maybe a few other crops as markets allow um, to help them decommodify, diversify and find direct offtake for those, those crops and products. And so for me, my encounter with corn was actually as a teenager and I grew up in a farming uh, county in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay and spent an awful lot of time in corn growing up as a farmhand. Um, I mean, so much dent corn in my life that would all go to feed um, either chickens in large concentrated uh, barns or cows in feed confinement, um, which is most of where corn goes today. And so I think corn gets a really bad rap because it's been so industrialized um, and is behind so much of the imbalances that we um, realize, feel, and, and have concerns about, whether it's climate change, whether it's use of fertilizer, whether it's the use of glyphosate and the ownership of seed, you know, by Monsanto or any, you know, all the Syngenta. And so corn, um, king corn gets a, uh, a really bad rap. And so in my own sort of explorations of, of corn, and there's nothing inherently bad about any plant. Um, I started trying to unwind the sort of lineage of corn, which is a vast subject. Um, the, the domestication of corn, the living with corn, the, the heritage of corn, the story of corn is, um, is beautiful, it's tumultuous, it's full of, of crazy stories. And so um, one of my favorite books on corn is this book, which I'm gonna read you three paragraphs from because I think it says it much better than I, um, which is called Corn and Capitalism how a botanical bastard grew to global dominance. And um, this book was originally written by um, Arturo Warman, um, translated by Nancy Westrate. And um, this book is powerful in shaping the sort of longer story of corn. And so I'm gonna read you just two paragraphs for sake of time. Uh, in the 500 years since contact between Europe and America, plants have stood out among the many treasures discovered in the new world. The wealth generated by plants probably has increased at a greater rate in more sustained fashion than any other American resource. In a given year, in 1980, when this was written, for example, the annual value of American crops was in the order of 200 billion, um, probably as higher than the total value of all precious metals exported from the Iberian colonies over the course of the entire colonial period. The seven most important crops today, wheat, rice, corn, maize, corn or maize, uh, potatoes, barley, sweet potatoes, and cassava supply at least half of all nutrients consumed worldwide. Four of those plants are from America, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and cassava, and make up about half the total volume of the top seven crops. More than a third of the world's food, either fresh or processed, comes from American plants. American plants are a potential source of great wealth, but also great poverty, misery, and exploitation. And he goes on to say, um, while it might be a chafe at term to call corn a bastard crop, it is entirely appropriate. The absence of or disagreements over corn's progenitor transforms such a strong word into nothing more than a descriptive adjective. I also use bastard in the sense of a person who has moved outside of its former social orbit, of one who remains outside the system of accepted norms. Corn entered the world system in this way. Enlightened elites use corn in this sense as a contemptible object subject to discrimination. Corn carried the stigma of being alien, strange, and poor. The wealthy judged corn and declared it to be guilty. The poor, on the contrary, opened their doors to it, embraced it, adopted it. Corn shared the fate of the poor and of that of the mixed race of the unchaste. A corn thrived virtually everywhere. Corn was an adventurer, a settler of new lands, one of those that helped fashion the modern world from distant sidelines. Corn was nearly absent from the colonial metropolises attributed to the construction of the modern world. 
Corn was on the frontiers of the modern world from where the modern world effectively sprang by virtue of hard work, imagination, and innovative in irreverence. Like many stories about the bastards in the world, this one has a happy ending. Corn's true identity as the ruler of the Western world is now a fact. Such a happy ending is not the final episode, rather the beginning. Now the bastard reigns. We hope that Corn will do so with justice, with grandeur, and a desire to serve. Corn came into its own hand, and to its own hand in hand with the poor of this world, a lesson we would do well not to forget. The bastard king can be one of the champions in the struggle for a world without hunger. It is something that Corn owes its to its past and to its history. It is something that we can together with Corn accomplish. So whether you agree with that or not, it's a fascinating um, narrative on the role of Corn. And I've heard many people call humans Corn Clan, and it's been central into the way that we've expanded across the world. We work with it an, an enormous amount with a lot of um, ambivalence. Um, and maybe later in the, in the discussion, we can get into the, the sort of unique sort of structure of corn from a photosynthetic uh, perspective, being a C4 plant versus a C3 plant, which I can explain later. But there's just, corn is a, is a wonderful crop. It's been demonized for its role in the industrial ag system, but it has um, such beauty, character, story, and potential. Um, and it's something that at Mad Ag, we really um, look forward to working with. Great, thank you so much, Bill. I'm looking forward to following up with some questions in the discussion. Go ahead and hand it over to Nick now. Awesome, hello everybody, my name is Nick. Um, I prepared a little slideshow presentation for this one too, so I'm gonna share my screen here and just say uh, thank you too for the ex expression about the indigenous placement too. And, I think that's really important in this discussion of corn. And so go on, on to that later here. Let's see. We... Can everybody see that? Yep, it looks great. Cool. Oh. <clears throat> cool. So, corn, a tool for, for cultural and ecological re uh, regeneration. Try not to be nervous here. This is a pretty uh, awesome panel. I'm kind of surprised that you guys picked me to be a part of this. So, <laughs> appreciate that too. Um, about me, um, I am a farmer taking care of Elk Run Farm. It's our sixth season coming up farming there, managing about 14 acres. Um, it's our little homestead. We eat about 80% uh, about 80 of the calories we consume come from the land there. Um, we tend a small forest garden, vegetable production, dry land staple grain fields where we grow blue corn, sorghum, amaranth, and dry beans, all without irrigation. Um, and we've developed some dry lands agroforestry systems, which is kind of oxymoronic, but we can talk more about that later. We raise sheep, pigs, chickens, and ducks all in rotational systems. Um, Elk Run is the demonstration site for our nonprofit, Drylands Agroecology Research. Um, a lot of what we've done is planting over 1,600 useful trees and shrubs without irrigation using contour earthworks. So in the process, we are breeding drought-tolerant agroforestry stock and drought-tolerant staple grain seeds. Uh, originally got our seed stock from Rich Pecoraro, so just want to mention him too. At the same time, just researching and collecting data to back the regenerative process and as a way to take this data collection to other sites, uh, sites that we are in partnership with. We are currently partnered with Metacarbon Organic Farms, managing, helping to manage about 65 acres there and developing Silvo pasture and other regenerative systems there. And Allen's Farm, Yellow Barn Farm, about 100 acres, both properties within a couple miles of our farm. Um, that's a little bit about us. And so just again, wanting to talk a little bit about the cultural context of corn. And the way that I understand it, this is the most prolific and widespread crop grown in North America historically, just like um, Phil was saying. Many indigenous cultures see corn as a direct relative of human beings and has evolved with humanity, which is a really important thing to note anthropologically as well. 
And as I understand it, many, if not all tribes have used corn as a staple food crop throughout the Americas. Um, the variety of corn planted has depended on the bioregion. So all different kinds of corn, sweet corns, dent corn, soft corns, all of that. Um, some of our Diné relatives, Navajo relatives have songs, prayers, and ceremonies particular to corn. Very few plant uh, crops like that as well as our Mexica relatives from Aztec country, southern um, central Mexico, um, use corn as an offering to land sport, uh, spirits themselves. So just interesting cultural notes on that. <clears throat> so what is corn's role in the ecosystem? As a farmer, we understand it's an annual crop and it could be used to build soil, but isn't inherently used to build soil because it's planted annually. So again, what are the big problems with corn that we all know and understand? The industrial farming practices, GMO production, high input chemical fertilizers, high tillage. And so we can all probably agree that's not really the best thing for, for us. So what could a regenerative approach to growing corn look like? Just going through a couple ideas and examples. Some simple examples that we know, uh, a lot of us know, uh, the three sisters, polyculture. So other, you know, using corn as a polyculture as opposed to a monoculture. Um, three sisters plantings are a good example of that. Um, corn grows tall as a stalk for the beans to grow on while the beans fix nitrogen in the soil while squash is growing below to shade the soil and keep it moist. This is a great example of how polycultures are good expressions of nature and how we can uh, grow healthy crops that way. Um, other ways that we've grown corn in polycultures at our farm is in the staple grain fields using nitrogen fixing ground covers to protect the soil and fix nitrogen. Um, so that's a, some pretty good examples of how we can use corn in regenerative systems. So maybe a little bit better ways even still. Um, using corn in rotational livestock systems. So say you have corn in fields growing, we can utilize pigs and chickens and other livestock to clear the fields and fertilize for the next, next plantings. Uh, these kind of systems can greatly reduce tillage and chemical input. Um, and in our experience, this also greatly reduces topsoil loss. So this beautiful relationship, right, where we're growing our corn, we harvest our corn. Uh, right after that, we send the pigs through the old corn fields. Pigs eat the stalks, they dig up all the roots, and they till the soil without really creating too much erosion or um, uh, issues that way. This can reduce the need for machinery. Um, after that, we can send our chickens back through these fields that'll clear the manure, eat the bugs out of the manure and spread this fertilizer and also add a different, different composition of fertilizer. Um, so we've used these rotations quickly. So as soon as the crops come down, send the animals in, clear the fields quickly and then let the fields rest over the winter. Um, some of our friends in Taos, New Mexico on the Pueblo there have told me that a common practice that they had was to keep pigs or cattle in a field for one to two years and then take the animals out and then till um, and plant corn the next season. Um, and so some things that we've seen from our research, um, looking at control samples from the open space fields behind us with about 2.7% organic matter, whereas just in three to four years using these rotational livestock systems in the cornfields, we're getting like seven to 8% organic matter in a really short period of time. So just watching that really, really boost things, which is cool to see. And so then forward towards what I think is one of the best examples of how corn can be used in a regenerative system. Corn as an alley crop in uh, contour agroforestry. So to understand that, we have to ask, what is contour agroforestry? This is basically planting rows of trees on contour, trees that are either intended to produce crops to feed animals or to feed humans. Um, we creating beautiful alleys between the rows of trees. These kinds of alleys can be worked with machinery, um, but these types of installations take many years to mature. So what's happening in the meantime? You know, we've just planted our trees, but we've got these alleys in between. So 
why not build soil and fertility in the alleys between the trees? So the same process can occur. We can plant our corn or other crops, harvest those crops, use livestock to clear the fields, fertilize, and continue to build soil. So I think that brings us to the question. I hope I'm not going too far over time-wise. Okay, cool. Why agroforestry? <clears throat> The way I understand it, trees, shrubs, and other perennials anchor the ecosystem, right? So these are perennial crops that are, that are continuing to mature and develop year after year. Um, through um, evapotransmission and other methods, these trees are storing water and releasing it later to maintain soil moisture levels. So in Colorado, this is really essential, right? In the super brittle climate that we have, where we're watching desertification take place, just the planting of trees and using alley systems to harvest and, and plant um, staple crops, we're maintaining soil moisture, which is essential. Uh, at the same time, these trees are creating habitat for birds, insects, and other wildlife that are essential to ecosystem health. And in other places in the world, we're watching how planting trees, just the simple act of planting trees is reversing desertification. So in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, great example of how um, just, just the tree plantings themselves are fighting against this desertification process. Um, so again, essential for our brittle bioregion. Um, cool. Yeah, I think that's all I have to share for now. Uh, glad to be a part, glad for the rest of the discussion. Awesome, thank you so much, Nick. That was really fascinating. I do not know a lot about agroforestry, so that was really incredible. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. I think we'll go ahead and hand it over to Dan. Do you wanna share your screen, Dan? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, thank great to be here, and I, and I also feel pretty honored to uh, follow um, you, Philip, and Nick. Um, you guys are the pioneers putting in the hard work. So um, it's a good, it is a good panel. Uh, so I do, I also have a slide deck and I, I don't consider myself to be an expert, expert on corn um, by any means. And so I, I'm gonna use the slides a little bit as a crutch. Um, but, it, but it's really, it's been really interesting to think about um, ever since we, you know, we started to have the conversation. Um, so I just wanted to share some food for thought, really, um, and we can can swing back and talk, you know, more detail um, about some of the topics that I'll show. So hopefully the the screen is sharing. It is um, sharing. It's a little bit. Well. Yeah, the image. Yeah, the the text it's a and the off image. Center, is, but it's okay. Oh, it is. Huh. For me, at least. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing that. It's off center for me as well, but I, I can get the, the gist. I think yeah. if you go for it, Daniel. Okay. Oh, there, it looks good now. Yeah, it's good it's now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think we, we, you know, this is a time of immense interest in agriculture. So not only, you know, among the people that are involved in the production aspects, um, but, you know, society more generally. And, you know, in the past, I think there's been a lot of focus on, some of the, the social costs that are related to agriculture and the, the negative externalities and pollution that come from it. And, and I'm really um, excited that, that recently there seems to be a lot more recognition about some of the, the social benefits um, you know, and goods that, that agriculture can help provide to society as well. And I think re the concept of regenerative agriculture um, really captures that, that agriculture can contribute to um, the health of the, the water, soil and air resources um, you know, and, and try to understand the, you know, kind of the mechanisms and roles that um, can, can contribute to that. Um, and so what, you know, when I think about what I'll add to the, the previous speakers, when I think about regenerative agriculture, you know, I think about the, the like the principles and practices, um, but I also think about the role of um, the consumer. And so I think, you know, a big part of regenerative agriculture is this broader recognition um, of the contribution that agriculture can make. And, you know, supply chains have basically become shorter. And this is true on both the small scale, if we think about local um, foods and also big scale. So these, these larger corporate um, supply chains, they're, they're recognizing that um, consumers are interested in where their food comes from, how it's produced, um, and want, want to have a say and influence um, some of that. So, you know, 
we have a few pioneers here who've already spoken, um, you know, who are ahead of the curve and, you know, other folks who, who might be later to the game, I think we'll start to take note as some of these, these larger, um, you know, players in the supply chain also start to look into regenerative practices. There's always a risk of greenwashing. Um, and so I'm not necessarily pro, you know, or con anything, um, you know, but, but it's a really interesting topic for discussion. So happy to be here. So as an economist um, who studies agriculture, I think there's really two lenses that, you know, I would set up um, as a way to, to think about the future of corn. And so we, as economists, we would call this the intensive margin and the extensive margin. And to, to break that down a little bit, you know, if we think about the intensive margin, it's basically, you know, the land that we're already using for corn production, how can we improve that and make that more sustainable? The extensive margin would be, you know, if we, if we do transition away from corn production systems, you know, we're not, we're never gonna get to zero, right? It might just be a, a small, you know, a small reduction in what's currently being grown. Um, you know, what might replace it um, and what factors might influence, right? How much corn is being produced. And so if we think about the existing corn production systems, I think it, you know, the, the ecological intensification that we saw examples of earlier um, is going to be really important going forward. So um, rotations, reducing tillage, cover crops, um, intercropping, those are all, um, you know, great ways that, that we can think about the future of corn and it, you know, kind of point us in the right direction. So technology will have a, a big role as well. Um, you know, and, and there are trade-offs with technology. So, you know, some of the genetic seed improvements, um, you know, ha may have negative impacts with the glyphosate and some resistance issues. At the same time, it's compatible with no-till production systems, right? And so we're, you know, we just have to continually evaluate those trade-offs and think about um, positives and negatives there. And then some of the policies and incentives. So, you know, some folks will be intrinsically motivated um, to, you know, integrate these practices. Um, and then there's going to be some policy incentive mechanisms that can be in, put in place to just further, um, you know, further attract, you know, more people to do it. And of course, that outreach and train the trainer and, and learning by doing and learning from others, I think is, is the other um, thing that'll be super important that we, you know, that we heard about that I don't have mentioned here. Um, you know, corn, it does have this, this incredibly long history. So, um, you know, not only from like a, a development perspective or like a, you know, selection and breeding perspective, but also the kind of the scientific and public policy attention that's been given to it. Um, and that's really led to the King Corn um, story, right? Um, and so that, that's also interwoven, I think, into this, this, you know, idea of the future of corn. That said, you know, a lot of people do depend on it for their livelihood. So, I, you know, I've heard that mentioned and it's important to think about. <clears throat> so I, I have a few, you know, visuals that, you know, I think will help put some numbers on some of the topics that we've already um, heard about. And so there's a lot of room for growth um, in this eco ecological intensification space. So we saw examples of cover crops and, the, you know, reduced tillage when, you know, and there are a lot of people that are practicing um, this, but it's really few when you look at the whole universe of all uh, corn and crop producers. And so thinking about how to push that even further, you know, to new audiences is going to be really important. So if we look at corn, um, you know, no-till or reduced tillage is only used on just about a third of the acres. So there's a lot of potential room for growth there and cover crops is even less. So this isn't broken out specifically by crop, um, but really only about 5% you know, of acres um, and even less than most other um, regions, you know, is being uh, planted with cover crops. So I just thought these numbers were a nice complement to some of the other discussion. Hopefully this can be seen, um, you know, just a couple things, just a couple things to frame the discussion. Um, so this is a, a slide that shows corn acreage and yield. And, um, from it looks like from 1980 to 2010, corn acreage increased from 60 million acres to 90 million acres, and they were anticipating it reaching 95 million last year. I think it fell a little bit short, um, but we're back up near record highs um, nationally for corn acreage. And in 1996, um, so almost near the bottom here, um, 
there was the Freedom to Farm Act. And so before 1996, a lot of planting decisions were um, dictated by historical planted acres. And in 1996, they loosened up some of the restrictions and made kind of just offered growers more flexibility to grow what they wanted. Because corn was profitable, uh, the, the acreage has actually increased since then quite a bit. So that, that's been an interesting policy angle um, for me to think about. This is the, this uh, figure shows uh, the end uses of corn. So basically where it goes, if we look back to 1980, um, corn that's being fed, you know, basically used as a food source um, is a very small share of all corn that's produced. I heard that mentioned earlier. You know, the bulk of it has been used as feed. Um, there's some exports shown in blue. And then really the, the recent development in the last couple of decades has been the ethanol market. And that's really expanded uh, got, been part of this push that's expanded corn acreage. So this red area, you know, basically it's corn that's fed to automobiles um, is the ethanol market. And since 2000, you can see that really expand. Um, and the corn that's used for other sources has actually decreased. But given the, the increase in, in the ethanol market, um, overall corn production has expanded. And so a couple of thoughts, you know, are, um, with this, so if we can transition, you know, for example, away from um, you know, gasoline and even ethanol vehicles into like electric vehicles, right, there might be some indirect um, effects in these other sectors that might actually lead to changes, you know, in the agricultural landscape um, and reduce corn production. And so, you know, grass fed beef may be another example, you know, so is there a way to transition away from corn um, and reduce the amount of feed that goes into, into livestock production? Um, using other sources. And so just, you know, I just thought these figures were nice um, to, to paint a, a big picture. This figure shows um, corn, the corn price received um, in total production. So, so corn, total corn production has been increasing. So yields have been increasing and the number of corn farms has decreased, but the average size has been increasing. And so even though you know, acreage has been increasing, um, yields are also increasing. And so this total production, um, if we just think of the volume of corn uh, has also been increasing. And the price has, has increased, uh, which is mostly driven by the, the ethanol recently. And so when we think about you know, the role of corn um, and particularly the regenerative aspects, you know, it's important to think about as corn acreage has increased or, if, you know, we start to transition away, you know, where might that corn leave the landscape? Um, you know, what have been the, the land use impacts? And so um, corn has expanded into a few new areas. So particularly in the north, um, a lot of the breed corn, recent corn breeding efforts have gone into short season hybrids and that opened up um, some new areas like in the Dakotas, for example, um, where corn has expanded. Um, Corns replace some crops in the south, like cotton. And there has been expansion into pasture, um, previously fallowed cropland and like CRP land. Um, and there's been some um, increase in, in the rotation. So as corn becomes more profitable, you know, land that's already grown to corn, but used in the rotation actually becomes more intensively um, grown to corn. Um, and so that's another you know, aspect that could be um, you know, thought about in terms of like, you know, the role of corn in the future. So thinking about um, transitions, you know, uh, you know, potentially, you know, where reductions in corn might appear in the landscape, can that be targeted, you know, to, to some of these more ecologically sensitive areas where we recently saw the expansion of corn. And I mentioned technology. So I, Technology can certainly improve the regenerative characteristics of corn. So I think that's pretty promising. This is this image is not from um, Colorado State University, but CSU does have ongoing um, field trials on corn varieties with like uh, larger root structures. And so, you know, there's potentially some like carbon storage benefits. And so, you know, over the next few decades, potentially, um, you know, some of the breeding can be efforts can be redirected. Um, you know, towards kind of enhancing existing corn production systems to make them more regenerative. 
of course, you know, then there's, you know, other aspects of technology. If it, you know, increases yield, makes it more profitable, corn production could also expand. And so, again, there's always trade-offs um, with that. And so, you know, other opportunities like improved nitrogen efficiency or water use efficiency, which is really relevant to Colorado, um, you know, are other potential avenues um, for, you know, for the future of corn and, and regenerative aspects. Let's see. So that was kind of a quick um, overview, but I just wanted to you know, highlight a few things from each of those slides and I'd be happy to go back um, and talk more about them as the conversation continues. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate that. I love the graphs. You can definitely tell that you're an economist. It was great to have the right. visuals. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and hand it over to Mary. Okay. Thank you all so much. And again, I want to acknowledge how honored I am to be here on this panel. And my goodness, anytime I'm on a panel with a farmer, I bow down. I bow down to you. You are magical. You are what makes this all happen. So I'm a dietitian and I'm here to bring in the health and nutrition and nutritional value component of what regenerative agriculture means and also what our industrial agriculture means as it relates to corn. So, um, so um, I'm Whoops. hearing, a, I'm hearing an, echo. an echo. Anybody else? Definitely hearing that. Me too. How about now? You're good. Hey, all right. So when we're thinking about sustainability and regenerative agriculture, regenerative diets, very often we've got stuck in the, in the word with sustainable because the reality is that we don't really want to sustain what we have because it ain't so great. So when we're thinking about this term of what regenerative agriculture, regeneratively based diets might mean, for me, it really has got to consider support and include all of these four tiers below. So number one is looking at human nutritional health, access to diverse foods, diverse uh, nutrient dense foods, um, reduced malnutrition. It also looks at the environment and planetary health. So fewer agrochemicals, less biodiversity, uh, more soil health exposure, less food waste, then there's also the economic benefit, which we cannot deny is a key part of this and very often the argument that we hear from our industrial agricultural friends. So it needs to be profitable to everybody. We need to make sure that everyone gets fair wages and food needs to be affordable to all people. And then there's a socio-cultural component, which is a key part of this conversation as well. Food needs to be culturally appropriate. It needs to be inclusive. We need to honor the, uh, the, the traditions of indigenous people, make sure that people have agency over their food, not just access to food, but agency to grow their own food. We need to focus on animal welfare, on welfare of the farm workers, and of course, looking at all the issues of gender discrimination and racism in our food system as it is right now. So these are four tiers that we always need to include, in my opinion, when we're talking about sustainability or regenerative agriculture and what it means for society and our culture at large. So corn, hey, corn is a great source of B vitamins. It's rich in minerals, it's rich in fiber. And as we were mentioning earlier, it is a cultural touchstone for so many indigenous communities. However, most of the corn that is grown right now, as we've been finding out tonight, is used for animal feed and for biofuel. Now, I don't know if you've chatted with a cow lately, but um, cows aren't really meant to eat corn. It causes gas, they don't digest it well, which leads to a host of whole other issues, which can also have an impact on the nutritional value of the meat and on the nutritional value of the food that we're consuming as humans. A lot of the food, uh, the corn, in fact, over 90% of corn is genetically modified. Uh, the human health implications of that are still being determined. We definitely know there's an impact on the environment and anything that affects the environment affects human health. As an eco dietitian, I cannot emphasize this enough. There simply is no way for us to separate environmental health from human health. They are intricately connected. Obviously the, the corn also uses a huge amount of land that is displacing all kinds of populations, communities, wildlife, pollinators. 
And the, the fact is that the corn that we are consuming, the majority of it is processed, right? So we're seeing tons of high fructose corn syrup. Uh, we're seeing corn uh, meal that's been highly processed. We're seeing corn oil. These are all being translated into these ultra processed foods, which are being highly consumed these days in our global society. And we know are connected and directly causing lots of diseases that are chronic, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, heart disease, even cancer. So for instance, something like high fructose corn syrup, we know that that um, is, is very affecting, very, very much affects insulin resistance, um, fatty liver, but it also can have an impact on our gut microbiome. And if you've been hiding under a rock, maybe you don't know that the gut microbiome is something that we are learning so much more about as it relates to human health. And we'll talk all about that as well when we talk to when we talk about the soil. So um, obviously all of this corn that gets grown for animal feed is also leading to deforestation, which again has a huge impact on human health because of the displacement and obviously because of the reduction in the ability of these forests to sequester carbon, which ultimately may help to stop uh, or mitigate climate change. So as I mentioned, Anything that affects the environment has implications for our health. So when we are growing these monocultures over and over again, we have a huge impact on the ecosystem, a tremendous impact on our soil. And when there's better quality soil, soil that is rich, soil that's not been tilled, soil that has been stayed alive with cover crops and, um, and, and good quality food, the plants are healthier. The plants are less susceptible to pests and disease. The plants are higher in micronutrients. They have tested this. They are higher in those phytochemicals, which are the plant chemicals that offer protection to us as humans from disease. And anytime we have an ability to grow food in better quality soil, boy, we are looking at a much better food supply. So when we have more diversity in our land, in the crops that are growing, um, we have better air, we have better soil, we have better water. And obviously, as I just mentioned, our nutrient density of the food is much better. So when we have a biodiverse system, this actually means that we have a more diverse diet. As I think Philip was mentioning up front, right now we're eating about 12 different staple foods, wheat and rice and corn, when there's so many other foods out there that can be contributing to the variety of our diet. And when our diet has more variety to it, that means we're more likely to have an adequate micronutrient uh, status overall as humans. Additionally, I come back to the gut microbiome. When our guts are being fed more diverse foods, more variety, the guts, uh, microbes in the gut tend to thrive much more. And that has huge implications for all kinds of systemic health issues that we might be coming across, including our brain health, our cardiovascular health, blood sugar issues, and autoimmunity. Additionally, when there's more biodiversity, there's much more likelihood that those plants and animals and pollinators will be hanging out, making friends, making, the, again, the soil much more healthy. And when the soil is healthy, we simply don't need as many inputs, right? So pesticides, which we know uh, when there's a more biodiverse system, the plants are acting almost as their own pesticides uh, themselves. Pesticide use is rampant. And this is affecting not only people who are directly utilizing the pesticides, people who are working in the field, people who are mixing those pesticides, we've seen huge impacts on human health from cancer to cardiovascular issues to again, Parkinson's, other autoimmune issues, inflammation. So, and then of course, um, anything that's meant to kill pests, bugs uh, may also have an impact. Um, and there's some research to show this as well on our own gut microbiome. So soil health equals human health. When a healthy soil microbiome exists, a healthier human microbiome is much more likely. And then there's the animal welfare. As I mentioned up front, we cannot look at this big picture of regenerative agriculture without, without also considering the welfare of those animals and the nutritional value of those animals when they are consuming corn, when they are living in those concentrated um, uh, feedlots, they are more susceptible to disease, they are taking antibiotics or fed antibiotics, which can lead to antibiotic resistance, which again has human health impacts. 
the quality of that meat when people are eating animal products in excess that have consumed a diet of high grain, that is a very different meat quality lower in omega-3s, lower in some healthy fatty acids that we would see in um, a, a grass-fed animal. Additionally, those who are working in those factory farms, in those slaughterhouses, there is a health, a human health component to that. So all of this corn that we are growing in our industrial agricultural society to feed these animals are ultimately having these downstream effects, not only on the quality of the animal life, the meat, but those who are working on those farms. Additionally, CAFOs tend to be settled in areas where people are lower income, communities of color. There's terrific water pollution, air pollution that has devastating health effects on these communities. And then if we're looking at the indigenous approach to agriculture, so much of the indigenous approach to growing food is about regeneration, fewer chemical inputs, supporting the life and the health of the community at large supporting the ecosystem and the eco region around them, increasing food sovereignty, incorporating livestock, which we know has a symbiotic relationship on the crops, uh, on the soil, as we saw in, in the wonderful farm of Nick. So these are just a few things that you can do. Um, as a consumer, uh, Dan pointed this out, you have a voice, you have power, you have influence. If you thought that the low fat movement was driven by industry, no, it was driven by us as consumers who were demanding that our foods be low fat. I'm not saying that was a good thing. That was not a good thing. We need our fat. But you can make a choice. You can support organic or regeneratively grown foods and local farms. CSAs eat more plant-based proteins, so there's less reliance on these uh, CAFOs. Support community gardens. Grow your own food, eat a more diverse diet, and support brands that actually have some kind of sustainability initiative that are working to source ingredients that are more sustainable and uh, relying less on deforesting. So that is it for right now. I'm happy to take questions and always delighted to talk about the power of food to bring health and nutritional value to all humans while also supporting the environment. Thank you, Mary. That was really inspiring. I really appreciate, um, you know, often when we think about regenerative farming and regenerative food systems, I think we're thinking about those on the ground practices. So I like that you made it more holistic talking about, you know, food sovereignty and human health, um, indigenous practices. Um, I really appreciate that. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, going to have my share here. Okay, great. We're going to move right into some questions. I noticed a lot of questions coming into the chat. Some questions that I've seen are kind of policy focused. So talking about subsidies or talking about splitting um, acres up to make sure that rural communities can be involved in this process. I think I would like to broaden that question a little bit and just ask our panelists, you know, what type of policies do we need to achieve maybe this higher level vision of what we think a regenerative food system looks like and some of the things that we're talking about tonight. And I know that's a broad question. Don't want to put anyone too, too on the spot or too under pressure, but I think it's important to be thinking about. Do you want to go ahead and start with Phil? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, two things. I mean, first of all, first off, um, um, we've got to stop subsidizing the wrong thing. We have to ask the big questions. Um, what are we growing corn for? And what is it serving? Is it creating planetary and human health? Or is it not? And um, the American sort of ethos and ideal has served the farmer for a long time, but we have to question what we're serving. And um, it's a hard thing to start pulling away the subsidy. I mean, this year alone, 36% of farm income came from subsidies because of the commodity market uh, that was fueling. Um, I mean, it's amazing. Has any of us ever expected the government to pay 36% of our income? And we're at a such desperate spot um, with commodities right now and corn and what it's serving in the world or not serving rather, that um, we've got to start being really courageous with our public policies and farm bill and tilting the needle. Right now, the farm bill scaffolds the industrial ag commodity complex that serves banking and big corporations. Um, the farmer is suffering. If you drive from Boulder to Pennsylvania, small towns are boarded up. There's obesity crises. There's the autoimmune crises. Everything that everyone on the panel was saying is not perpetuating a system of, um, of abundance and vibrancy that we long for in rural America. 
And um, there are, gosh, a litany of policies that need to be altered and changed. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that we leave the farmer behind. That's the problem with a lot of the sort of regulatory change that we seek. The system is the problem, it's not the person. Farmers are good people, they mean well, their intentions are true, um, but we've built systems that scaffold injustice. And um, just like we've learned in racism, you know, especially since George Floyd's death, like the institutional structure of our systems is not serving the world or the people, and we've got to change it. And there's a, a lot of ideas around how to do that. Um, I'm really excited about who the Biden administration is bringing in. Tom Vilsack is an interesting one, um, but some of the undersecretaries underneath him are just really awesome individuals um, that represent a lot of indigenous wisdom and bring that to bear. So yeah, I, I, I could go on, but I'll, I'll digress. Thanks, Phil. Can I hand it over to Nick or Dan or Mary? Awesome, yeah, I'll share a little bit. Yeah, just, just piggybacking on what Phil said, I mean, corn was never intended to be a food for cattle. So the fact that so much of the corn in America is being directed towards cattle feedlot operations is just horrendous. There's really no ecological reason that that should be happening. Uh, we're seeing the destructive effects of that just in our world, just like Mary and everybody's talking about and poor diet, poor health. And it's just pretty clear that incentivizing ecological practices is incredibly important right now. We see that agriculture can be a force of good and we need to see that in the policy spectrum immediately or else we're facing pretty tough times, it looks like. So that's about all I have to say on that and thanks. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important to think about is our US dietary guidelines, which were just updated in 2020. There's a huge disconnect between what the government is telling us we should be eating, this many fruits and vegetables, this much meat per week, and what we're actually producing. So we're producing over 500% of, of animal products than we are being recommended to eat. We're producing you know, close to half of what we are being recommended to eat in the fruit and vegetable category. So that is a huge um, disconnect between what the government is saying we should do and what they're actually allowing to happen. So being more active, I think, again, as as consumers, as, as individuals on the political front to really speak up because the USDA is dictating uh, part of those USDA, uh, those US dietary guidelines. And this is a tremendous opportunity for us to help mitigate climate change with how our guidelines are, are gonna be shifting over the next decade. Yeah, and I would add, you know, policies that, that create markets um, you know, for these, you know, both to incentivize, incentivize good production practices and existing corn production systems is one, but also to help us shift towards that, you know, alternative um, food supply model and alternative food supply chains um, is really important. So, you know, I think farmers, producers would respond and change what they grow, you know, if those markets were there and if they had certainty that they could, you know, make a livelihood in doing so. And so I, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember who made the comment about the, you know, the banking, um, you know, and lending industry, you know, sometimes it's challenging to get um, financing, you know, for new startups or to expand into new areas if, if you can't prove that, you know, there's a market um, for that good. And so I, I think thinking about policies that, that pull us in the right direction, um, are you know equally important to think about you know kind of uh, you know push factors against maybe what you know what we see that we don't like. Um, we should also just be kind of creating the space that welcomes people into these new production systems and new areas. And I, I think that's really uh, what I would like to see more of. Yeah, I'll riff on that a second and just say that like most farmers can't adopt cover crops because it threatens their farm insurance policy. Yeah. Um, it's perceived as risky. And so the, the banking system, which is highly conservative, is, is really slow to change. And so a lot of these regenerative techniques that we're talking about are actually not possible within the current system of that scaffolds industrial ag. Um, it's why at Mad Ag, I mean, we launched an alternative bank for farmers so they could actually skirt their community bank situation. We raised $10 million. We just closed the fund last week so that folks could actually you know, essentially not use the operating capital that that locks them in and obligates them into the industrial system 
we, we create an alternative bank that liberates their imagination so they can move forward and go regenerative, go organic and, and do it. Because, you know, in the current system, there are so many barriers that, that, that reinforce in, um, the extractive industrial complex that it's, it's hard for a farmer to even have the emotional psycho toolkit to imagine something other. Um, I, I honestly, I've worked with so many farmers in the middle of the country that have lost the, the ability to dream because of the, the, um, the, 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 um, the gravity of the system. Um, when you go across the country from here to Pennsylvania, not only are towns boarded up, but the entire economy is crisscrossed with railroad tracks and grain elevators. There is no alternative for farmers to grow corn, beans, or alfalfa. Um, because of consolidation, because everything has been centralized with corporate power, farmers have no options. They're stuck and they're squeezed between the rising costs of inputs and stagnant value for their crops, neither of which they have control over. And so they're just suffering through the pinch of basically no control over input costs and no control over the value of their crops because it's all controlled by futures in the Chicago Board of Trade. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically eviscerating the soul of our heartland. Yeah, and in, in addition to the, you know, the kind of the institutional barriers, if we think about, you know, alternatives like, like fresh vegetables, that, you know, the operating cost per acre can be 10 to 20 times higher, uh, you know, to produce an acre of like, you know, mixed vegetables than, you know, some of the, the more commodity row crops. And so it just takes all that much more capital um, to get that production done. It's also more perishable. And the, the timeliness issues of like, you know, when to harvest, when to pick and how, you know, the time that you have to get that um, to market is a lot narrower than something like corn that is, you know, very storable, right, that you can harvest and store it um, and market it, you know, in this much wider window. So some of those just those technical um, challenges come up as well. And, you know, in the a lot of the, the rural infrastructure that you do see for the corn soybean system is a product of you know, governmental support. And so can we do something similar to that for these other uh, crops and commodities? Thank you, everyone. Well, we only have a couple minutes left, but I do wanna ask another question if it's okay with everyone and kind of a closing question, food for thought here. And um, we talked a lot about the role of the consumer in the food system and in, the, in a regenerative food system. I'm wondering what are some consumer or what are some changes that we can make as consumers um, are there local farms that we can support? Are there crops that we should be choosing to eat for the climate? What should we be doing? Should we be pressuring our legislators? Um, and, you know, keeping in mind that often healthy food is more expensive. So how can this be something that is inclusive as well? And whoever wants to start can just go for it. I'll say one of the best things you can do uh, in terms of reducing your carbon food print is to eat more beans and legumes. Um, these are amazing nitrogen fixers, naturally. Uh, th that means a reduction in meat consumption, which we know is having a huge impact on, on land. This is not be about being vegan. This is about reducing our consumption of meat that's produced in an industrial agricultural system. So uh, just for the, uh, the, the sake of being quick here, because everyone else wants to get a chance to speak, eat more beans, eat more legumes, support that. Those are cheap, they're easy, and they're super delicious filling and very, very nutritious. And eat more corn. I mean, look at Nick and his blue corn. I mean, his uh, the elder that has taught both of us, Rick, Rich uh, Pecoraro from Masa Seed Foundation, who is uh, the seed keeper of the entire Front Range, um, uh, such a privilege to be in his presence, um, you know, has stewarded those seeds from long lineages and, um, and to make a good tortilla and eat a taco, you know, just eat the corn, you know, and I think that's a really important thing, the flavor, the beauty, the quality. And, um, and I don't know if uh, Nick, you're selling stuff yet, but buy local, buy from Nick, buy for people who care and are investing in, in paving the way for the future. And I would add that a lot of times at the local level, um, policies are much more progressive than at the federal level. So there are cities like Denver that have good food purchasing programs and, you know, have set up kind of these, you know, star rating 
um, programs, you know, that, that look at the characteristics of the production systems from where they're um, supplying their foods. And so, be, you know, kind of speak up, be an advocate, support those types of programs, um, farm to school programs. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of those can actually have as much of an impact on, you know, local and individual um, farms and producers as, a, you know, like a blanket federal program could. Yeah, I think just the local food movement in general just speaks to that on the whole. I mean, the, the less distance your food has to go, the better off we all are reducing carbon footprint that way. And I mean, I'm just a big proponent of regenerative meat, just seeing how much animals can have an impact in benefiting the environment. I'm actually more on the side of encouraging rede regenerative meat production and reducing annual croppage because um, Perennial ecosystems really are the future and animals are an integral part of that, um, as, as well as annual crops at the right times in the ecosystem development, um, but mostly just eating locally and understanding where you are, what crops are growing, um, supporting local farmers, I think. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Once again, we are over time. We're always over time on this. The hour always flies by. It's always a fascinating discussion. I think the talk tonight was um, just really beautiful and insightful. And I think that continuing to have these conversations um, and build relationships around topics like this is really important. So I really appreciate you all coming out tonight. I appreciate our panelists and again, Dina and Rebecca for your support and help on this. Um, I'm going to drop my email in the chat if anyone needs to get in contact with me or have any questions. I'll definitely make this recording available. Um, and if you have any questions for the panelists, they can drop their emails in the chat if they're comfortable or you can reach out to me and I can always get in touch with them too. So thank you everyone. I really appreciate it. I'll stay on for a minute. So if anyone wants to grab anything from the chat before I sign off. Thank you. Yeah, it was a wonderful so conversation. I feel like we just were the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so thanks for hosting. An honor to meet you all and be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Likewise. Thank you, Dina. Cheers. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you again. Take care. Bye-bye.